We begin now the subject of equalization, channel equalization. Because equalization is not well covered in the text we have been using so far in the Sklar textbook, I've provided you with a few other references which will be able to give you some reading material to support the lectures I'll be giving now. In fact, there's a, an article in a journal by Sklar which is all about a particular equalizer which we will be looking at today, and it's an excellent article. I really recommend this uh, uh, reading. Uh, I also have two other textbooks on digital communications, one in English, one in French, that uh, I have found the chapters which cover equalization and have produced on our web page for the course these chapters to give you some more background reading if you should need it. So we'll start our discussion of equalization with the maximum likelihood sequence estimator, the MLSE. Remember, uh, one of the reasons that we are going to do equalization, why am I talking about equalization today, is that it's a technique to combat the intersymbol interference. And in particular, let me talk about what we've seen before, which is when intersymbol interference appears because we are sending our data through a channel which is poorly adapted to it. So here I have a frequency domain representation, and I have a trace in yellow, which represents the signal. And the signal is rectangular in the time domain. So here in this frequency domain representation, the Fourier transform of a rectangle is a, uh, a um, sync function. And so in yellow, we see the sync function. And in pink, I have traced the um, frequency response of the channel that I've simulated. So in this case, we can see that the frequency domain of the channel has a bandwidth which is much narrower than the bandwidth of our system, however you want to de de design the, define the bandwidth of our signal. Clearly the signal is much wider than the bandwidth we're trying to put it through. In fact, I think it's 10% as I uh, mentioned here. Now, if I look at what happens in the time domain to the signal before I put it through that channel and after I put it through this channel, uh, this is what I get. Before filtering, I get this blue um, a blue trace, which is just a rectangle, and after fil filtering, I get the yellow trace. And that is because the, uh, the effect of passing my signal through a channel, which is much too narrow for it, is to actually spread that time domain signal out and make it slower, because I'm forcing it to go through, uh, I'm cutting off all the high frequency con content, so I cannot go with transitions as fast as, as this one. So, because the signal is spread in time, I get the effect that we call intersymbol interference. Now, imagine that I had just one impulse. I have one impulse, I send it. I send it through a narrow channel, and so I get this spreading, and there's no other points, there's no other symbols afterwards, so it doesn't cause any problem. Now, imagine that I have a series of symbols, a sequence of symbols which is transmitted. So now when I get that first symbol transmitted and it is spread out in time, that means that it's going to be around to mess up the signal for the next symbol that comes around. And so this is what we refer to as intersymbol interference. So instead of having uh, a nice, uh, se clearly identifiable sequence of bits here, I instead have this amorphous lump for a signal, and I can't tell uh, exactly which bits are sent. It's much more prone to errors due to this intersymbol interference. Now, we've looked so far at optimization criteria for signals for systems where there was no intersymbol interference. So when there is no intersymbol interference, in this case, we could uh, devise a strategy what would be a good way to detect our signal. And we came up with the maximum likelihood receiver, and in order to maximize the likelihood of our decisions, we used a sampling, a linear sampling receiver such as the one that we see here. And this receiver, now we have the signal which is transmitted, it's combined with noise, it arrives at the receiver RFT. First thing we do is we match filter it, so we have a filter, we match it to the signal that's transmitted. Next thing we do is we sample it, and then we compare this um, test statistic, the sample that we've measured, we compare it to a threshold. And depending on whether it's large or smaller is whether we make a, we make a bit of decision of logical zero or logical one. 
And that threshold was determined by the system configuration and it would let us maximum, maximize the likelihood. So when we did this analysis, we found that there was kind of like an equivalent way of looking at what was going on with this receiver. First thing I want you to notice is that this receiver examines one symbol interval at a time. We have one symbol interval, we make one test statistic, we compare that test statistic to a, a threshold, and then we determine what, the, what it is. And then the next bit interval comes along and we do the whole thing again. But it's always a one shot, look only at one symbol interval. And we saw that comparing it to a threshold was essentially the equivalent of comparing that received signal with all of the points in a constellation. So for instance, suppose I had a um, QPSK constellation, four points. If I had some signal that was received there, what would I do? I would compare, I would calculate the distance. What's the distance to symbol one? What's the symbol, uh, distance to symbol two? distance to symbol 3, distance to symbol 4, and clearly it's closer here to the second symbol, and so that would be my estimate. My estimate would be the second sy symbol for this R that I received. So that was the maximum likelihood receiver. So this is optimal when there is no intersymbol interference. So what do we do in the case of intersymbol interference? What changes? Well, I still would like to maximize the likelihood that still seems like a good idea. But what's different now is that I cannot afford to just look at one symbol interval at a time. Because I mean, I, inter symbol interference is going to introduce dependencies from one symbol interval into the next. Depending on whether I had a one before me or a zero before me, the level of inter symbol interference could be different. Depends on the modulation format. So I really need to look at sequences. So the big difference between a, signal, uh, a system where there is no ISI and a system where there is ISI is that I have to abandon this idea of one symbol, uh, examining one symbol at a time if I want to get the maximum likelihood. So if I want to get maximum likelihood estimation of what was transmitted, I have to examine a sequence. And that sequence that I examine, I have to look at a certain window. And the window of symbols uh, that I have to look at, of received um, test statistics, is not just one test statistic in one symbol interval, but I have to look at a whole window. And that window size is determined by the memory of the channel. So a channel which is, has the um, uh, pulse spread much more will require a larger window than a channel that spreads the pulse a little bit. And so it depends on the channel exactly how long this observation window should be. And we call that the channel memory. So uh, if we look here, I'm going to use a notation now about not one little i, which says which one of these four. <laughs> That's what that i did, represented which one of the four I would choose as being the, uh, the optimal choice. Now I have a whole collection of indices, a whole sequence. So this represents the sequence, and it's as long as N, and what is N? N is the memory of our channel. And so what I have to do is I have to do this calculation for every one of the possible se sequences. So you can imagine if I have uh, M um, is the number of points in the constellation, and N is the number of uh, uh, the length of the memory of the channel, then I have something like m to the m sequences that might be best. So that means I have to examine for each one of these m to the n sequences, I, ca I calculate this weighted sum, uh, not weighted sum, um, this uh, distance between one sequence and another, which is the sum of all the distances between each one of the elements in the sequence. And I have to get this metric. I have to calculate this for each one of the sequences. Boom, 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 each one of the sequences. And when I'm all done with that, I look, well, which one's got the smallest distance? OK, that's the sequence I'm going to choose. OK, but it sounds awful already, like really complex. We can see that. But the important thing is the decision is not one um, 
bit, uh, one symbol, you're, you have to make a decision on the entire sequence, which one of the sequences was best. But even though I do that, in the end, what I keep is just one. And I'll come back to this discussion. But I have to examine a whole sequence. So let's uh, just back up and, and look again at what we know about the maximum likelihood sequence estimator. Um, it's optimal. It is the best approach you can use in a channel with intersymbol interference. It is, it is possible with the MLSE to actually completely eliminate the intersymbol interference. Not for all channels, but for some channels. For some channels, we would actually be able to get rid of the ISI effect completely. But let's face it, it is extremely complex. For each bit, we have to examine all the m to the n sequences that are available. Now, I, I should mention that there is some, there are some tricks that we can use to try and soothe out all that complexity, and with that is called the Viterbi algorithm. So it's the Viterbi algorithm can help us with complexity. It doesn't get rid of the complexity, but it makes it uh, a little more practical to implement. And in fact, what we would do is the form of our receiver if we were going to use maximum likelihood sequence estimation is just like before I would have my match filter, just like before I would sample after that match filter, but now I add another step and that other step is the Viterbi algorithm which is an algorithm which calculates the maximum likelihood sequence estimate in a very um, uh, computationally effective memory, uh, minimizing the amount of memory required, uh, very efficient VLSI implementation. So it's possible, but it's still complex. So I said I would come back and uh, talk a little bit more about what we're doing when we're examining the sequences. So like I said, we examine m to the n sequences, choose the best one. There's one among those m to the n that is better than all the other ones, has the smallest distance, and I pick that one. But remember, all of that effort was in order to decide what was the best symbol during this interval? Then what do I do? I keep this, and I go on to the next symbol. And I start the whole process all over again. So I don't use the results that I had previously. No, now I have a whole other set of sequences. When I get to the new S0, at the next interval of time, I recalculate again all of the M to the N. And this is what makes it very complex. Now what does the Viterbi algorithm do? The Viterbi approach uses a structure that defines the interrelations between the uh, symbols, and it uses a trellis, kind of like a, a garden trellis, um, and this structure captures the interdependencies introduced by the channel. The size of this trellis is related to this complexity number m to the n. However, I don't have to start from scratch at each point and re-examine all to the m to the n. What I do is I can use some recurrence relationships to bring down the, re the complexity of the operations. And you know, like here, there's calculating a lot of distances squared, summing, all that. I make this much more streamlined. And I also manage the memory that's required in order to do my, um, run my algorithm. And so this is uh, used in um, different applications areas, and not just for maximum likelihood and sequence estimation. Uh, so this is, is, is very well known. So I said it's not just for equalization. In fact, one of the biggest uses for Viterbi was the uh, use for convolutional codes, or error correcting codes, forward error correcting codes. And this is a system where at the transmitter, I encode the information which is going to be transmitted over a noisy channel. And I deliberately introduce correlations between the bits before I transmit them in this, in the, across the channel. Then, at the receiver, I know what the transmitter did. I know exactly what the correlations were that were introduced at the transmitter. And at the receiver, I use the structure of this uh, correlation that was introduced and the Viterbi algorithm and together I can go in and find where errors were made, correct them, and uh, generally you know, like really boost the, the um, performance of my system. So this is probably a place where we see Viterbi used very much. But the second one 
is for an ISI channel. Because what is similar between these two um, situations is that there is also in an intersymbol interference channel correlations which are introduced between bits. If I had a 1 before, it's different than if I had a 0 before because that behavior is different. In this case, uh, I don't have the luxury of choosing uh, dependencies which are really useful. So here, you know, there's a whole set of mathematics where I introduce correlations which are easy to exploit in my decoder and can actually correct lots of errors. Here I just have to sort of deal with the channel I'm, I'm stuck with. So I have a certain physical channel which gives me a physical uh, frequency response and this is introducing ISI because I'm just trying to push data through at a rate that's just too high. It introduces ISI. Okay, so there's correlations. That's what's similar between these two. Remember, ISI is deterministic. It's not like noise. It's not random. There's structure to it. If I know exactly what the sequence is, I know exactly what the uh, ISI is. So it's deterministic. So the MLSE can use the Viterbi algorithm to exploit the correlations and just come up with better detection. That is what MLSE is. Now, let's contrast our approaches to dealing with additive white Gaussian noise to our approach with dealing with intersymbol interference. Remember, additive white Gaussian noise is random, ISI is deterministic. When it's random, what do we do? Well, we introduce this idea of a matched filter. And what the matched filter does is it optimizes the signal to noise ratio. Remember, the additive white Gaussian noise is flat spectrally, completely flat. When I send a signal, it has a certain shape. So what does my match filter do? Well, it says I'm going to match the shape so that as much of the signal gets through as possible, but because the signal is shaped, I'm going to eliminate uh, the noise where there's not much signal content. And so what that does is it makes the signal to noise ratio optimal. So no filter, no equalizer can predict additive white Gaussian noise. It's not possible. It's random. It, it can't equalize that noise. But when we talk about intersymbol interference, then we talk about predicting. We talk about examining a sequence and having a good idea of what the previous bits were because of looking at how things added up. And so um, it's uh, possible to uh, use some sort of predictive approach or equalization approach for ISI, which just doesn't work for additive white Gaussian noise. The match filter, it doesn't do anything for the ISI. It does make things cleaner because I have the best signal to noise ratio I can, and so when I'm going to run my equalizer, it's doing it with uh, less noise present. That's, that, that's a good thing. So filtering, indeed, can improve uh, ISI as a, an equalizer, different from the match filter. Okay, first, the first step match filter just increases the signal to noise ratio. I can introduce another filter, and this other filter can start working on the ISI problem once I've gotten the, the, the noise sort of dealt with. Um, but that would not necessarily be optimal. The MLSE is the optimal solution, and it's not a filter. Okay? A filter is linear. This is a nonlinear operation that we're doing with our maximum likelihood sequence estimation. So let's have a look at some simulations and see what kind of performance we can get from a maximum likelihood sequence estimator. So one thing we know about the maximum likelihood sequence estimator is we need knowledge of the channel in order to exploit it. That is, if we were doing a, a forward error correction, we would have at the transmitter an encoder. And it's the knowledge of the encoder that allows us to have a decoder at the receiver. And it's kind of the same situation when I do maximum likelihood sequence estimation. Again, I have to have knowledge of what are those interdependencies. I'm going to build a structure that lets me exploit them, but I have to know what they are. So I have to know what the channel is. Now, the complexity of the algorithm, it depends on, as I mentioned already, the number of points in the constellation, the channel memory, and uh, for those. Uh, I'm going to talk about now some simulation of the MLSE in MATLAB. So MATLAB has a pre-programmed equalizer known as the Maximum Likelihood Sequence Estimator, and it takes and implements a Viterbi algorithm. So you have to tell it what the 
the, the actual channel is. So we enter into MATLAB the channel coefficients. We have to have knowledge of the channel. And if we look closely, we also have to tell it what the constellation is. So here are the constellation points. In this case, there are four points, m equal 4, and those are the coefficients for QPSK. Now, we also have to know what's the memory length, how long is the, the memory of the channel. And, of course, here we can see that we have uh, four coefficients in this um, channel, so that there is an extension of uh, three uh, symbol intervals for the memory of the channel. So once you give this information to MATLAB, what MATLAB does is it builds a trellis, it builds a Viterbi algorithm trellis, and the complexity of that trellis is, goes as m to the uh, l minus 1, uh, is the number of states which are examined in the uh, Viterbi algorithm. And then it executes a Viterbi algorithm. So we're going to look at some results of simulations for some channels using this tool from MATLAB. So <laughs> the first thing we could look at is what's known as a Butterworth channel. So Butterworth is kind of filter, and if I were to plot this filter in the frequency response, in the frequency domain, what did this filter look like, this Butterworth? I didn't put the equations down, but you can, you can look them up. Well, there's a whole family of Butterworth channels, or Butterworth filters, and depending on the order of those filters, you would get a different kind of frequency response. So you, you can see that the um, response is, is very, very smooth, very, very well behaved for the Butterworth channel. There's a very flat portion and then a gentle roll-off, and that roll-off, it's just the slope which varies from one order of the uh, filter to another. So these filters, this is some channels, we could completely eliminate the ISI. This is one where we can completely eliminate the ISI. So there's some structure to this um, filter, which means that we get very, very good behavior with this one. And so, in fact, if I were going to plot the bit error rate following equalization of a Butterworth channel, I would actually get uh, the, the theoretical curve. So we have come up with theory. We have come up with expressions for the bit error rate versus signal-to-noise ratio, this EB over N0. We have come up with a, an equation for that, and that's valid only if we're in a channel without ISI. So here's one where we have a channel with ISI. The, uh, if I plotted the bit error rate without equalization, it would be very bad. But the MLSE brings us back down to that prediction. So that's not true for all channels. And let's take another example. Here's a channel where the, freak, the impulse response is given here. So just, you know, maybe stating the obvious, but I'll just draw it out. That's H of T is this uh, frequency, res uh, sorry, impulse response. And remember, these are the channel coefficients, which I'm giving into MATLAB. And MATLAB is using those to build a trellis to understand the interdependencies. So it needs this information in order to work. But remember, there's a Fourier transform relationship between the impulse response and the frequency response. So if I just take these coefficients, put them into an FFT, I would get this as the frequency response uh, for this channel. Now, this scale that I've chosen for this frequency response is such that the um, signal sort of fills up this frequency range. This is the frequency band of the signal. This is the frequency response of the channel that I'm going to pass the signal through. And of course, this is narrower than the signal because this main lobe does not fill up the whole area. <laughs> so the whole area is the signal I'm trying to push through, and this is something that's copying it. And even more important is that we have some really deep fades here where the channel is almost completely zeroing out, it effectively is zeroing out the uh, signal. So what does that mean? Well, you know, the equalizer cannot perform miracles. If the channel actually cuts off portions of my signal, puts it down to zero, well, it's down to zero. It's gone. And I can't recreate that. So for sure, for this channel, I'm not going to completely eliminate the intersymbol interference because I have lost information. There's this information which is lost here, which I cannot recover. So this 
uh, channel, we're going to uh, run through MATLAB and we'll see what kind of performance uh, we get for this channel. So this is the performance of this channel. Now I have bit error rate versus EB over N0. And these results were generated in MATLAB. In fact, it uses a nice command, a nice demonstration uh, routine in MATLAB called EQ BER demo, equalizer, BER demo. And it tests many different kinds of equalizers, equalizers that we'll be discussing. Uh, for now, I'll concentrate on just the results for the MLSE. And so I'll uh, just keep those curves for now. And in yellow is the no ISI. So if I didn't put it through a channel, I put it through a channel which is an all-pass filter, which doesn't change um, my signal at all, I would get the bit error rate from uh, theory. But because I have um, ISI, I have lots of impairments, and if I showed the bit error rate you know, with no equalizer, it like, would be terrible, terrible, terrible. But now I run an equalizer, this extremely complex, high-performance, nonlinear, maximum likelihood sequence estimator, and it does a good job of getting rid of any bit error rate floor from the ISI, still get a nice waterfall curve, but I have 6 dB of loss because this channel has got those deep fades, and those deep fades are unrecoverable, and so although I do get a waterfall, there is a loss for this channel. So in summary, for the maximum likelihood sequence estimator, what are the advantages? Well, it's optimal. It's the best you can do. Um, it's great to know the optimal. It's usually very useful information because if I'm going to look at something that's suboptimal, I would like to know, well, how suboptimal it is. So I can compare the performance I get from a, an easier equalizer and say, well, if it's pretty close, then why would I go to the work to do the optimal one if the suboptimal one is close? So it's a great to have a lower bound for other equalizers. And of course, I mentioned there are some where I can completely Im eliminate the ISI. So not only is it optimal, sometimes it's like perfect. So what are the disadvantages over here? Of course, the disadvantages are that it is high complexity. For sure, that's the disadvantage of MLSE. Sometimes uh, it's just impossible. I mean, the, 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 we don't have electronics that can do it in real time. Um, or even in really slow time, if it, it really blows up very fast. Um, also, another disadvantage of using the MLSE is a delay. Because remember, I have to look at all of the sequences, and if the memory is really long, you know, I have to wait. Uh, I can't decide right away. I've got to wait until I accumulate some information about other bits in order to see, you know, what's the best sequence. And there are some applications for which, you know, this kind of output delay would be completely intolerable. Think of, oh, let's say um, intelligent vehicles, self-driving cars. You know, there's a certain time period for processing that information, and we can't afford delays. So that could be a disadvantage that despite its, its good performance, we wouldn't be able to tolerate uh, the output delay. And of course, I said it requires knowledge of the channel. It's often the case, but it requires knowledge of the channel. And you know, I just here are some things that we can do to sort of counteract the fact that it's a disadvantage. So um, even though I need to know the channel, if I don't know it, well, I can use like a training sequence. I send a sequence of bits where the receiver knows what I sent it, and it can take that knowledge and use that to actually estimate the channel, get an idea of what the channel is doing. Uh, in terms of the complexity, there's another thing I can do here when I'm using my knowledge of the channel is that I can look at the channel and say, well, the memory is like really long, it's like 10. But, you know, when I look at it, eh, I can approximate it by 3, and that would be good enough because the other ones are very, very small and that much energy in them. And so by truncated, truncating my estimated impulse response, I can sort of make the complexity not so bad. So, MLSE has got some great advantages. Big disadvantage is complexity.